1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 11 through verse number 16. And the word of the Lord today from the King James text reads, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, or weigheth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Amen. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic, How Do You Know Him? Amen. How do you know Him? If you'll bow your heads with me one more time, Master, Savior, Redeemer, Friend of Sinners, Savior of Lost Men. We thank you, God, today for the Word of the Lord, for the Word of the Lord is life and breath and His sustenance. To the believer, it is the source of hope and healing and faith and salvation. Master, in the name of Jesus, we need the anointing of the Holy Ghost to break open the wells of wisdom, to loosen the mind of those today, God, who would hear that they might hear with spiritual ears and not with carnal ears, for the things of God are spiritually discerned. If ever there's been a time in the history of the church when the church is full of carnal men who understand only carnal concepts and carnal preaching, that hour is now and we need spiritual men and women to rise up those today who are able to be instructed of the Holy Ghost. Those who are able to hear and know that that which they hear is inspired and anointed of God. Anoint today, O oh God, the speaker. Help me to do justice, O oh God, to this message which you've laid on my heart for the people of God at this dark hour. Anoint the ear of every hearer. Let our heart today be prepared that the soil of our soul might be good ground upon which the Word of God is scattered and planted. Lord, that it might bring forth root, that it might bring forth fruit and vegetation, that it might grow unto righteousness and true holiness in our lives. We ask all this in none other than Jesus' wonderful, precious, saving name. Amen. Praise God and amen. How do you know him? For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? The Apostle Paul asks the church at Corinth today, How do men understand things in the carnal? How do we understand things in the natural? Well, it's easy because the natural is within us. The carnal is within us. Therefore, 
we're able to understand those things with which we identify and those things which we share similarity with. He goes on to say, the same is true for those things which are spiritual, things which pertain unto God. Carnal men cannot understand things that pertain to the Almighty because they are not familiar with those things. They do not share anything in common with those things. But God has imparted to the church today the Holy Ghost which is from heaven and that spirit within us has enabled us to share in common the divine, the supernatural, that which is of and by God. And the Word of God tells us today in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that spiritual things are spiritually understood. Carnal things are carnally understood. The message that God has given me today will likely fall deaf upon the ears of carnal Christians. Christians whose understanding and knowledge of God goes no deeper than their carnal mind and their carnal desires and their carnal fleshly thinking. But those today who are hungry for something deeper and more spiritual, I believe today, you will leave this message having gleaned something very important. I remember when I was a kid growing up in southern New England. I grew up in a beautiful environment. I never appreciated it so much as I do now. I, I appreciate it so much greater now that I'm an adult and I've left home and grown up. But I grew up in such a lovely environment in southern New England, an area filled with mountains. Mountains not as high as perhaps the Colorado Rockies or other great mountain ranges in our nation, but mountains nonetheless. And you either lived on a mountain or you lived at the base of a mountain in Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, in that part of the country. Those are the only two places you can live. There, we don't have wide open flat plains, you know. You just don't see areas like that up there. All the farmland that exists in New England at one time was treed. It was forested. And many years ago when our forefathers came to this country, they had to go in and they had to cut down all these trees. They had to pull out all those trunks of those trees they had cut down. They had to literally remove all of the rocks and stones that were in the earth so that the ground could be tilled so they could plant because there were not any great large areas of fertile soil that were available. You literally had to make fields and make areas where you could plant crops. Little town I grew up in had at least three dairy farms that I'm familiar with. And one of those dairy farmers, Joe Smith used to drive around every morning in his little milk truck. Some of y'all are too young to remember this, but Joe would drive around in his milk truck and he would deliver uh, at the crack of dawn. He would be out uh, delivering milk to each and every home in the community that had subscribed to his service. I remember going out and checking the milk box. We had a little milk box on the porch, you know. A little insulated box and you'd open that up and there'd be your milk sitting in little uh, containers, glass containers inside the milk box and we'd bring it in the house. I mean you couldn't get it any fresher than that. The place I grew up in was honestly I never thought about it. I never realized it growing up but it was so much like a Norman Rockwell painting, you know, it was just so quaint and everybody knew everybody and 
the, the people that taught me in school had taught my mother. If they hadn't taught my mother, they had studied with my mother. My third grade teacher was the schoolmate of my mother's. And uh, they had gone to school, to high school together. And, uh, you know, it's just one of those kind of communities, very quaint, very small. Our population in my town that I grew up in wasn't but about 3,000 people. And there were a string of little towns, and we were the littlest in the entire valley. But there were a string of towns, and the town to the north of us was considerably larger. And that's where the church I grew up in was. And then the town to the south of us was uh, almost as large or about as large as the town to the north of us. And that was the town that my father's family had grown up in. He and his siblings, and my grandparents on my dad's side lived in the town south of us. And I remember growing up as a kid. And I remember it seemed like everywhere we went, my father was constantly waving at somebody. And he used to have this, this thing he did. I, I, you know, I don't know why, but he always acted like he was shooting a gun. Whenever he'd see somebody he knew and they looked at him, he'd go like this at him, you know, like he was shooting a gun at him. I never knew back then how little people thought of my dad and how he was not the most liked person on the planet. But uh, no wonder he was shooting at everybody because there wasn't very many people that cared for him very much, but I didn't know that as a kid. But I remember oftentimes we'd be riding through the valley or we'd go to a store to go shopping and we didn't have any shopping really in our little town. You had to go north or you had to go south at least one town to do any kind of shopping. And then if you had real big shopping and you needed a mall, then you'd have to drive a few towns to the north or a few towns to the uh, south to go to one of the cities. The Connecticut has some smaller cities like Bridgeport and Waterbury, New Haven. We'd go to various places and next thing you know, there'd be my father shooting his imaginary pistol at somebody. And I remember oftentimes my mother would look at him across the car or over the top of the shopping cart and she'd say, well, how do you know him? And my father would say, well, I work with him. That's a co-worker of mine. I work with him. His name is so-and-so. Or we'd be somewhere and my father would pull out his little imaginary pistol and shoot at somebody. And my mother would say, well, how do you know her? And my dad would say, I went to school with her. She was a schoolmate of mine. We were in class together. But it seemed like everywhere we went, my father knew somebody. And oftentimes, my mother would be asking him, and how do you know that individual? You know, by my father's conduct, we knew that somehow, some way, he knew that person. We just didn't know how. And curiosity killed the cat. And we'd ask the question, well, how do you know that person? How do you know that person? There are many people today who claim to know God. Many people today call themselves Christians and they claim to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and, and yet my question to them today is really and uh, how do you know Him? How do you know Him? I want to tell you there's a lot of answers that can come back that are quite carnal. Well, you know, I believe in God. I love when people think that I believe in God is a rallying cry. I love when people think that someone saying I believe in God is sufficient uh, common ground for them to fight in the same war, for them to walk the same path as another simply because they make the declaration I believe in God. 
I got news for you today, my friend. There is no more carnal, earthly, worldly, fleshly a declaration that anyone can make than simply, I believe in God. It doesn't take a whole lot of nothing for someone to quote-unquote believe in God got news for you according to the word of God human beings have been uh, designed we have been created with the innate understanding that there is a creator that there is a God you can go into virtually every single society in human history and you will find some remnant of religion, some remnant of faith, some remnant of belief in divinity. It doesn't take a very spiritual man or woman to believe in God. The Word of God tells us today, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. In Proverbs 9 and 10, that's Hebrews 11 and 6, in Proverbs 9 verse 10, the word of the Lord said, For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding if you're going to come to God you must first believe that he is well now if you can believe that he is without having found him think about what I'm about to say how spiritual must you be to believe that he is you don't have to be spiritual at all. There are many people out there today who can say, I believe in God. Really, you believe in God? And how do you know Him? What do you mean? How do you know Him? Oh, well, He's God. Okay. What is He to you? Well, He's God. Well, what does that mean? they can barely explain what they mean in saying that. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. got news for you today, my friend. Not everybody who claims faith in God uh, believes in the same God that you and I believe in today. There are myriads, vast varieties of ideologies and theologies that exist in our world today People say, I believe in God, but the God they believe in is not the God I believe in. And the God I believe in most certainly is not the God they believe in. We have Americans in this country who would vote for Satan so long as he ran on a Republican ticket and claimed to be pro-life. I'll never understand that as long as I live. I grew up in a fundamentalist evangelical church, and the church I grew up in taught me that a baby is born without sin. That It's unscriptural, but I'm not going to go into that. And they said, oh, a child is born innocent and until they reach the age of accountability. Again, a concept which has no biblical support whatsoever. Until that child reaches the age of accountability, if anything should happen to them and they die, they immediately fly up yonder to heaven. All children are innocent. And all children will spend eternity in the presence of God. So when a child dies, they immediately go to heaven. Well, if that's true, then why in the world is there such an uproar over abortion? If these children are being spared the pain of poverty, if they're being spared the pain of a hurtful, mean, malicious world, and if they are being expedited from their mother's womb to the presence of God, then why in the world 
Should abortion be so divisive an issue? Why should it be so great an issue? Because the religious right wants to have its cake and eat it too. They want to claim, well, but you know, all life is precious and blah, 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 blah. Well, wait a minute. That's all well and good, but if you believe one, then you should believe the other. And if you believe the other, then why in the world would you not wish any child they're not committing suicide. They're not killing themselves to go to heaven. Somebody doing it for them. So why are you not rejoicing in that knowledge, knowing that these children are filling heaven? But we got people in this country that will vote for Lucifer so long as he runs on the Republican ticket and as long as he claims to be pro-life. As long as he makes the declaration, I believe in God. Or sometimes they're a little more crafty. I believe in Jesus Christ. But they don't believe in the same Jesus I believe in. Republican Mitt Romney ran for president a couple of election cycles ago. A Mormon. Got news for you, honey. The God of the Mormons is not the God of Judeo-Christianity. The God of the Mormons is not the God of the fundamentalist evangelical Christian. The Jesus Christ of the Mormon is not the Jesus Christ that is taught in the Word of God and that is preached by evangelical Christians. And yet, there were millions of evangelical Christians who claimed such great spirituality that they were willing to vote for this man because after all, he may be Mormon, but he believes in God. No, he believes in a God. He believes in Jesus Christ. No, he believes in a Jesus Christ. The Jesus Christ that he believes in is one of the sons of God. And Lucifer, Satan, is the one of the other sons of the Mormon God, making Jesus and Lucifer brothers. And according to their doctrine, Lucifer, Satan, and Jesus both presented a plan for salvation to the Father at the beginning of creation. And God the Father rejected Lucifer, Satan's plan, and opted for Jesus' plan instead. Does that sound anything at all like what you and I believe today? Does that sound like anything at all like what the Word of God teaches us today? No, it's not even close. But we had millions of so-called Christians who call themselves so deeply spiritual uh, clamoring to support this man simply because he made the declaration, <clears throat> I believe in God. I embrace Jesus Christ. I want to tell you, the spiritual things cannot be discerned by carnal men. Carnal things are understood by carnal men. Earthly things are understood by earthly men. But spiritual things require the mind of Christ. They require the indwelling presence of the Holy Ghost. The claim that one believes in God is the shallowest layer of faith and understanding of the divine that one can possibly possess. It's the most shallow. So if I ask someone today, how do you know Him? Meaning, how do you know God? And if they answer me, well, I know Him to be God. They're not saying a whole lot of nothing. I'm going to tell you, I have hang-ups. I'm very old-fashioned Pentecostal, and I make no apologies for that whatsoever. People in the LGBT community don't quite understand me because I don't fit in with the mold. I don't go with the anything goes theology. I'm not into this hyper-spirituality or hyper-faith or hyper-grace as they might want to call it. I'm not buying into the Unitarian Universalist mindset 
uh, I'm not buying into the anything goes mindset that God overlooks all things and we're not responsible to carry ourselves and to live our lives in a manner uh, that is pleasing in His sight. Don't buy it, don't believe it, don't preach it, it ain't so. People don't understand I, I'm just too bloody old-fashioned for a lot of people. But I'm going to tell you a little secret. I have a hang-up. When I go to a church and I'm listening to the pastor preach or I'm listening to the leadership uh, during the song service, during the worship service, during the preaching, if I hear people constantly referring to the Lord, now notice the term I just used, the Lord. If I hear people constantly referring to the Lord as God, if I hear the word God more often than I hear any other title, I begin to worry. That suggests to me that these people have a very shallow, very basic understanding of the divine, that their knowledge of God is very shallow. It doesn't run very deep. I hear preachers on television, I hear, I've heard preachers in pulpits talking about God this and God that and God this and God that. And constantly, Tommy, I hear the word God, God, God. And God is a very shallow way of addressing the divine. That, that you know, you can't get any shallower than God. And I want to ask these people, how do you know Him? Do you not know Him today as your Father? When we pray, you'll notice sometimes I begin my prayer with Father. Sometimes I begin my prayer with Lord. Sometimes I begin my prayer with King Jesus. Sometimes I begin my prayer with Master. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? You see, sometimes I begin my prayer with a variety of titles. Master, Savior, Redeemer, Friend. Hallelujah. Why do I do this? Because I enjoy spouting off words. No, 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 no. Because from the depth of my spirit, I know God in many different ways at many different levels. I know Him as far more than simply God. I know Him as my Master. I know Him as my Lord. I know Him as my Savior. I know Him as my friend. I know Him as my King. I know Him as my Redeemer. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, I'm going to tell you, sometimes people who are not very spiritual, they'll hear someone refer to the Lord, and that Though that word almost kind of rubs them funny. It feels funny to them. What, 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 what's he saying, Lord? Don't let the preacher say, Master, because their carnal mind begins to jerk a little and twitch a little. Well, what does he mean, Master? That, that sounds funny. That sounds strange. That sounds like he's a slave. And that God is somehow his master. Oh, that sounds cultish to me. That, that doesn't strike my ear well. I know people when they first come into the faith, it's very difficult for them to say, He is Lord. He is Lord. He has risen from the dead, and He is Lord. Every knee shall bow, bow. every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. They can sing the words because the words sound religious. But when it comes to talking about, quote-unquote, God, 
they're much more comfortable saying, well, God this and Jesus that. They're not comfortable saying, well, you know, the Lord laid on my heart. No, it's, well, God laid on my heart. Do you know what I'm talking about? Some of us, some of you who are listening right now, you know exactly what I'm talking about because the bristles kind of rise on the back of your neck when you try to use the word Lord. It kind of causes your tongue to twitch when you try to use the title Lord because it, it just doesn't, doesn't quite settle right in your thinking. But you see, the more spiritual you become and the deeper your walk with God becomes, and the more you begin to know God at various levels, the easier it becomes to say, how do I know Him? I know Him as Lord. Hallelujah. What is Lord compared to God? God simply means the one who is above all. That In, in the most generic Definition, God simply means the one who is above all. But when we acknowledge God as our Father, we acknowledge Him as the one who gave us life. I do not mean physical life, I mean spiritual life. I got news for you today, my friend. God is not every man's father. That is a misnomer, that is a misunderstanding, that is not what the Word of God teaches. He is every man's creator, yes, but he is not every man's father. The Word of God teaches that we are born spiritually dead. The Word of God said that we are dead in sin. Am I telling the truth? We are dead in sin. We are spiritually dead. It is not until God comes along and through faith and obedience to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that we partake of His Spirit and God breathes new life into our spiritual man, thus adopting us. The Word of God said we have received the Spirit of adoption. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We call God Father. We call Him Daddy because He has adopted us. If you recall at one point, Jesus had a little discourse with some scribes and Pharisees and they were upset with Him. And they said, We have only one Father and that is God. And Jesus said, no, God is not your father. He said, your father is the devil. He was a liar from the beginning. And the father of lies, that's who your father is. You see, when we're born into this world, we are born with Satan as our father. And it's when we're saved and born again through faith in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is then and only then that we are adopted by God into the kingdom and family of heaven. And then we, like a newborn child, learn, listen to me now, learn to call him Father. A baby doesn't come out of the womb calling his daddy Father, does he? No, a child has to learn the term. He has to learn what that term means. Now, does that mean he doesn't have a father? He's got a father. But he hadn't yet learned what that means so that he can be asked, well, how do you know that man? Oh, that's my father. Hallelujah. Oh, somebody asked me, how do you know him? I'll tell you how I know him. He's my father. Hallelujah. He went to great lengths to adopt me. Praise the name of the Lord. He went to great lengths to make me a part of His family. I share in the inheritance that He's provided for the saints. Hallelujah. Everything in His household is available to me because He is my Father. Hallelujah. How do you know Him? Do you know God today as your Father? which is in heaven, Jesus said, when you pray, 
pray like this. Our Father, which art in heaven. Oh my goodness, said, don't pray God. God do this. God do that. No, 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 no. When you go to the Lord in prayer, honey, the best way you can go to Him is knowing Him and acknowledging Him as your Father. He is your adopted head of household. And you're never afraid to ask your dad for those things which you have need of, are you? Amen. But if all you know him as is, quote, God, that sets him much further off, much further away. That puts him in a position that you're not quite so comfortable approaching him and asking him for those things which you have need of. But when all of a sudden that man's face... As you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, suddenly that face is no longer the face of that man I see every time I open my eyes from taking a nap, or that man I see every time my mother picks me up out of the bed and brings me to the kitchen. All of a sudden, no, no, that face is the face of my father. And when you know God is your father, all of a sudden, the dynamic changes, doesn't it? And the way we approach Him, the Word of God said that we now have the right to boldly come before the throne of grace. Why? Because He is not merely God, but He is our Father. Do you know Him today as Lord? What does Lord mean? See, we, we're familiar with these titles. We've heard them all our lives, but we don't really understand what they mean. Lord means He has ownership of all. This is why we use the term in the English language, landlord. That means that that individual is the possessor, the legal owner of that property. Got news for you. The person who makes the rules for that property is the landlord, not the tenant. The tenant cannot do with that property whatever they wish to do, whatever they'd like to do. No, you must either have it in writing that you have the uh, uh, right or the permission to do certain things, or you must run it by the landlord. Am I telling the truth? Before, you can't even paint the house. You can't even paint a room in the house until you've gotten permission from the landlord. Unless the landlord has included a clause within the lease that allows you to do this. Why? Because in the end, he owns the property. That is his property. Why is it important today for Christians, for believers, to know God as Lord? Well, if He's the Lord in your life, then that means that uh, He's the final authority. He owns everything. Hello now. Everything that pertains to you, He owns. And I tell the truth. Everything. Where you live, He owns. Your children, He owns. This is why we have a tradition of dedicating our children to the Lord. Because in ancient times, if a slave, if a servant had children, those, ch those children became the property of the Lord. They became part of His household. And so we dedicate our children to the Lord. We're acknowledging you are the Lord of my life. And as the Lord of my life, even my children are yours. And I give them back to you. It's hard to have to say goodbye to our child in this life. I think there's nothing more terrible than a parent, especially when the child is still of a reasonably young age or a young age, it's awful hard 
to have to let go and see that child pass into the next life. But when Jesus is Lord of your life, you understand, God, my child is yours to do with as you please. And if you choose to take my child at an early age, I know that you have done so for only the best possible reasons. There's a lot of hurt that comes with life. There's a lot of trouble that comes with life. That child may have been spared more than you could ever even begin to imagine. You don't know what God's doing or why God is doing it. But when you acknowledge Him as Lord, you understand He is the owner of all. And therefore, He has the sovereign right to do as He pleases with whatever He chooses to do with. Am I telling the truth now? Deuteronomy 6 and 4 declares, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The Lord our God, the owner of all is our God, and our God is the owner of all. In Acts chapter 2 and verse number 36, Peter declares, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Not only is he the promised one, not only is he the Messiah, the anointed one whom God promised through prophets in ages past, but God has made this man Jesus Lord as well, meaning he is the owner of all things. Acts 16 verse 31, and they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Why do I know him as Lord? Because the word of God declares Jesus Christ to be Lord. And the word of God also tells me that there's only one Lord and that Lord is God and that God is Lord. And therefore, if Jesus Christ is Lord, then Jesus Christ must also be God. Because there is not a Lord separate from God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. But the ownership of all things was God's. Man caused the ownership rights to pass to Lucifer through his disobedience in the garden. Jesus Christ took back ownership of all things on the cross of Calvary. Hallelujah. Therefore, he is both Christ and Lord. My goodness. Yes, when I pray, I say Lord. When I refer to the Lord, I speak of him as Lord. Because I acknowledge he's the owner of all things. I'm going to tell you, when I go to God in prayer, there is nothing more comforting to me. There is nothing that brings me greater peace and greater hope than knowing that he is Lord. Because that means there's not a thing in the world that I can possibly need that he can't provide. Because he's the owner of all things. Hallelujah, the word of God declares. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The word of God declares, but my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Everything there is belongs to my God. Therefore, if I need something, I don't have to worry that God doesn't have access to it. I don't have to worry that the Lord cannot provide. Hallelujah. Oh, my Lord can provide. Glory to God. Hallelujah. He is Lord. How 
do you know him today? Do you know him only in the most carnal of sense? Do you know him only in the most fleshly of senses as God? Or do you know him as your father? Do you know him as Lord? Do you know him as master? Oh my goodness, here's a term. A lot of people really get tongue-tied. They try to refer to the Lord as master of their life. As master, he is the one in charge or the one in control. We often look at it in terms of a master and slave position, but that is not quite how it plays out in spiritual things. It is, but it isn't. When you hire a plumber or you hire an electrician to come to your home, you may get two or three individuals who come, especially two, oftentimes there'll be two. Oftentimes you'll have an apprentice or you'll have an assistant and then you'll have the master plumber or the master electrician or the master carpenter. Does that mean that the master carpenter, the master electrician, the master plumber orders the other guy around and can make him do any old thing he wants him to do and, and you know, cause him to embarrass himself and humiliate himself? No, it means this one knows all there is to know to have mastered that profession. See, I call Jesus Master because I know He knows everything there is to know to help me navigate my way through life. There isn't a decision I make. There isn't a direction I can take that I can't turn to Him and say, Master, which direction ought I to go in? Hallelujah. And He will give me right counsel. He will give me wisdom. He will give me understanding. He will direct me in the right path. He will give me correct instruction so that I can do what I'm trying to do and I can do it right. Am I telling the truth now? Oh, hallelujah. He's never going to steer me wrong. He is never going to steer me in a wrong position, in a wrong way, in an incorrect direction. He will always guide me in the way that I am to go. The Lord is my shepherd. You know, there's another word. That can be inserted there. The Lord is my master. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. You see, master is the one who leads. Master is the one who gives instruction. Am I telling the truth? Oh, he'll tell you when you need to slow down. He'll tell you when you need to speed up. He'll tell you when you need to be more careful and more thoughtful about what you're doing. I've had incidents in my life, and I'm trying to hurry today. I've had incidents in my life where I've been offered something. I'll never forget years and years and years ago, I had come to Texas, and I was basically homeless for a period of time. The lady I rented my apartment from needed the apartment that I was in for a nurse to take care of her. She had cancer, and she asked me if I'd be able to move. Well, I had no money to move. I was just 16, 17 years old, and I didn't have the money. I worked, and I went to school, and, but I was only making minimum wage, you know, and I didn't have the money to move, so I lived out of my little station wagon for a period of time. And this man knew of my circumstance. They used to go into a 7-Eleven that I frequented and I hung out in because I knew some of the employees and I was very friendly with them and bless their hearts. They used to let me kind of hang out there sometimes and visit with them. And this man got to know me and he knew my situation and one day he came to me and said, well, you know what, why don't you come live with me? I'll let you live with me. And that way you don't have to live out of your car and everything. 
And when that man said that to me, immediately I heard a voice, I kid you not, in my spirit, I heard a voice say, as plainly as you could hear a voice, don't you dare accept his offer. It was not a mild voice. It was not a mild warning. It was a very potent and powerful, urgent warning. Don't you dare accept this man's offer. And I told the man, I said, well, uh, let me think about it. But immediately I knew, in my spirit, I knew God was telling me, no, 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 you don't do that. Well, a day or so later, he came back and said, well, what did you decide? And I said, you know, I said, I, I think I'm just going to leave things where they are right now. I said, thank you very much for the offer, but no thank you. And this man blew a fit. Well, what kind of idiot are you? You'd rather live in your car. I mean, he blew a fit, like, you know. What, what kind of reaction was that? But see, he's my master. And when my master gives me direction, Tommy, I'm not stupid and foolish enough to question him. I don't care if it meant going from living in my car to living in a house. Only God knows what horrible situation I might have moved into. You see, a lot of people in this life think that just because an opportunity presents itself that looks prettier than the, op than the situation that they're in, that that is God opening a door. And I've got news for you, that is not always true. I've seen many people who are less than spiritual walk into disaster after disaster after disaster, claiming the whole time that God was opening doors in their lives. Am I telling the truth? Why? Because they did not know Him as Master. If they knew Him as Master, He would speak to them as their Master. You see, God can't be the Master of your life unless you yield to Him as your Master. Often when I pray, I begin my prayer. Master, I mean what I'm saying. If you give me direction, Lord, that's the direction I'm going in. Hallelujah. We sang the song today. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. How many people sing the words, but they no more mean them than they mean anything? Because the minute the Lord needs to do something in a manner that isn't quite in keeping with their will and their way, they're going to go their own way. They're going to follow their own will. Am I telling the truth today? Do you know Him today as Master? In Matthew 19, verses 16 through 22, we read the story of what is commonly referred to as the rich young ruler, and behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he, meaning Jesus, said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Notice the Lord only gave the commandments that referred to man's interaction with man. He didn't start with, uh, he didn't start with worship only God, have no idols, so on and so forth. All the commandments he quoted were relative to how we ought to conduct ourselves in this life. The young man said unto him, saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, meaning complete or whole, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. 
But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowfully, for he had great possessions. Yeah, here's somebody who could use the term master, but he didn't mean it. If Christ were truly his master, he would have done what his master said. Am I telling the truth? You see, that's the whole purpose of that relationship. He came to him asking him a question that you would only ask of your master. But when he got the answer back, all of a sudden, the one he called master was no longer his master. And he walked away. I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of Christians in our world today. They claim to know Jesus. They claim to know the Lord as master of their life. But every time the Lord asks something of them that doesn't quite mesh with their carnal thinking and their earthly ways, suddenly they part sorrowfully. Because that's not quite what they're interested in doing. Lastly today, how do you know Him? Do you know Him as Savior? Do you know Him as the one who saved, the one who rescued, the one who redeems? In Isaiah 43 verses 10 through 12, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant, whom I have chosen that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am He. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Do you know him today as Savior? I'll tell you, the Lord has pulled my fat out of the fire more often than I can even begin to share with you today. He saved me. There's an old song that we sing in the church, an old chorus that we used to sing, Look what the Lord hath done, look what the Lord hath done. He healed my body, He touched my mind, He saved me just in time. Hallelujah. I'm going to praise His name, He's always just the same. I'm going to praise Him, I'm going to praise Him. Look what the Lord hath done. I know Him today as my Savior. He has saved me, He has rescued me, He has redeemed me. In John chapter 4 verses 39 through 42. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on Him for the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that I ever did. This is the Samaritan woman at the well that Jesus conversed with. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. And he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. And said unto the woman, Now we believe. Not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Do you know him today as the Savior? Titus 2.11 tells us we're looking today for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, children, today, if all you know Him as is God, you don't know Him very well. 